Right. I think um, it's past the allotted time. We always try and start on time. We're late, actually. That's very bad. I'm normally uh, a stickler for these things. Uh, welcome to another evidence session for the um, Commission on State uh, Fragility. Um, I, I normally start these sessions by just a very brief reminder of what we're trying to do. Um, and it's a relatively simple sounding task. It's just horrendously complicated in practice. Um, we are recognizing that pretty soon 50% of the world's poorest people will be living in states that are affected by fragility and conflict and instability. And so we are trying to write the book, as it were, for the next stage of aid and development, bearing in mind this fact. What is it that we can do to help build stronger, more capable, more legitimate uh, states? What should DFID do? What should USAID do? What should the international institutions do? What should governments themselves do? What should civil society do? What should business do? That's the question we are attempting um, to answer. We've had evidence sessions so far on how to build state legitimacy, how to improve states' capability to do the things that people need, how to try and help tackle uh, conflict and other forms of strife. And this week, uh, we're having a session on the resilience of states to cope with uh, disasters. And today we're doing the absolute vital subject of how to encourage um, private sector development, which is why we've got such a strong uh, range of uh, witnesses. And a very warm welcome to you all and thank you for coming. In a way, what we've got to try and do on the Commission is we've got to look at all the academic evidence that is available. And we've got, as co-chairs, excellent um, academics, and we've got representation from across the world on that front. We've also got to try and understand the real world picture, uh, the real world picture in terms of what is working and what doesn't. And that really is where today comes in. The question really for all of the witnesses with your different levels of expertise is what have you seen that you're doing or others are doing that's working? What is not working? What needs to change? What are the policies and the approaches that would make a difference. I would urge you to be extremely frank, extremely candid. There are cameras, but this doesn't seem to go on uh, any television channel that any of you have heard of. Um, so I'd be as frank as you like. You know, you've got, the thing is you've got in your own fields years of experience of doing what you do. And this commission will only work if we really are brutally frank and honest about what works and what um, doesn't. Now we're going to hear from, so we've got Murli Barudi, De Director of Economics and Stability at MEGA. We've got Paddy Doherty, CEO of Phoenix Africa. We've got um, uh, Mr. El Kazanada, Founding Director of Koala Holdings. Neil Gregory, Head of Thought Leadership at IFC. And welcome, um, thank, thank you James uh, Mwangi from the Equity Group Holdings PLC. And we've got Diana Noble, former Chief Executive of the Commonwealth Development Corporation, CDC. Um, so, pretty good mixture of uh, people. I'm going to ask all of you to do um, sort of five minutes, and we'll be pretty tough because six people, five minutes is quite a lot of time for everyone to listen. Um, and then we'll do questions, which will be from all the commissioners. Um, and we've got the commissioners here and some in the audience. And we've also got members of the audience, some who are students here at LSE, who might want to join in with questions as well. Um, the aim here is we do the first session, then we have a coffee break, and we come back for more um, discussion. Let's see how it goes. We may we may have that coffee break, or if you're all absolutely on fire, we may just keep you, may hold you here for um, a bit longer. Um, but we're going to start with the five minutes some um, from everybody. Um, let us start with you, Murley. Is that okay? Welcome. Thank you for flying in from Senegal. So uh, it's good to have you here. Thank you so much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I hope that um, I can add some value. Um, I am with uh, MEGA, which is the Multilateral Investment Guarantee Agency. It is an agency of the World Bank Group. Uh, of course, I'm joined by a colleague here from the IFC. So, uh, of course, uh, IFC has uh, um, a, also a large uh, interest in f working in fragile and conflict-affected states. Uh, MEGA, in particular, uh, offers a particular uh, de-risking instruments, which are very valuable in the context of fragile and conflict-affected states. So we offer guarantee insurance for private sector foreign investors coming into these environments. We offer coverage for uh, violence and uh, political civil unrest. We offer uh, coverage against expropriation, uh, against breach of contract, 
uh, and against transfer and, in and convertibility restrictions. So these four coverages are particularly uh, relevant to private in investors coming in to fragile and conflict-affected states. We at MEGA have been uh, trying to in increase our presence in these, in these countries, partly reflecting interest from our shareholders to do more and to use our instruments more for de-risking uh, private sector investors in these countries. And we have, um, we have been successful in increasing our volume uh, and business there. Uh, many of our successful projects have been in areas of c connectivity. So we have worked in, in sectors where we have uh, been promoting essentially connectivity with respect to uh, telecoms, with respect to transportation uh, in particular, and uh, with, which includes both goods and services transport. And these areas have, in some places, uh, been uh, very, our projects have been very successfully evaluated by our independent evaluations unit. So uh, from an independent evaluation, we, we have had successful projects in, in, in many conflict-affected areas. In particular, I, I would mention Afghanistan, where we have uh, successfully worked uh, with others uh, in the World Bank group around telecoms projects there. Uh, I, I would say that um, there is an emphasis on our doing more, and we're uh, working on two new tools, platforms, frameworks, which would hopefully help us increase our presence in these countries. So in some ways, it's a, a very, it's a period where we are um, going to be experimenting with some new approaches that we hope we will be able to increase our impact. So the two approaches are a um, maximizing finance for development, uh, which is an approach which looks to leverage all institutions within the World Bank group to mobilize private sector finance. And this is also, it's, a, it's a, an approach across all countries, but there's also an emphasis on fragile and conflict-affected states. So the point here would be to recognize that the impact that private investment can have can uh, often be ha often be much greater than some aspects of public investment, and that public investment can be reserved for areas that the private sector is is not going to be operating in to free and allow a, a freer use of uh, of resources for private sector investment, and uh, that. That is one element of a new approach across the World Bank group. A second is a part of our uh, IDA 18 replenishment, which is an IFC MEGA uh, private sector window. And here we will be having money from IDA uh, helping us backstop projects, uh, private sector projects that MEGA will be guaranteeing with, um, with support from IDA to help us do more and have more of an impact in fragile and conflict-affected states. So this is a, a major development. Uh, IDA had, the IDA replenishment is $2.5 billion, so um, $500 million of which will be used for MEGA guarantees over the three-year period of the IDA replenishment. And uh, m much of this will be devoted to fragile and conflict-affected states. So in many ways, this will be a, uh, somewhat of an experimental approach for us and an area where we're hoping to see um, a, a, some bigger developments. And I was just speaking uh, earlier on um, uh, about Sierra Leone. So right now, we're looking to deploy our first financing for this private sector window in that country. So, uh, so this is an area we're really looking to grow on. Thanks. Just one abuse of chair's privilege, but one quick question. If there was one thing that stops you doing more of what you do, 
what would it be? Is it the replenishment and the resources? Is it the difficulty of working in the States? Is it something else? Because that's one of the things we've got to ask everybody, you know, because you're obviously doing something very worthwhile, because otherwise these projects wouldn't go ahead. What's the one thing that, that stops you doing more of it? Uh, we don't have bankable projects. Right, right. Okay, very clear answer. Thank you. Paddy, you're next. Um, Sierra Leone, very good link, because you've spent quite a lot of time there. We have indeed, yes. And uh, let me say thank you, first of all, to the Commission for having me speak here. It's a, a subject about which I feel strongly, as I think will become evident. Uh, so I'm delighted to be here today. <coughs> thank you. Uh, in the time available, I'm going to race through a few points under three headings, uh, opportunity, obstacle, and a partial solution. First on opportunity, from our perspective, I think we should be viewing fragile states and post-conflict countries as an opportunity, uh, as a positive opportunity. Uh, not merely as a, a problem to be solved. And, and that's exemplified in the, the Phoenix Africa business model. Uh, Phoenix Africa was established a few years ago to build a series of development impact projects in uh, post-conflict countries in Africa, founded on the, the, the simple uh, insight that very often post-conflict and fragile states are nothing like as dangerous as you would imagine you know, from a casual glance at the newspapers or from, you know, dimly remembered um, TV news report from a, a decade ago. Uh, but because of that reputation problem, uh, investors generally <coughs> don't even visit, let alone deploy tens of millions of dollars, uh, especially in the kinds of countries that, that we look at. Uh, and that neglect provides an opportunity. Uh, that was the, the simple insight behind uh, Phoenix Africa. So at the very beginning, I did what was essentially a grand tour of the most beaten up bits of Africa. I went to Somaliland, DRC, uh, South Sudan, <coughs> Rwanda. Well, not, not that Rwanda is beaten up anymore, but you, you know what I mean, post-conflict countries. And out of all of those countries, easily the, the best fit for our model was Sierra Leone because <coughs> of the, the vast gap between the perception in the popular understanding uh, and the reality on the ground. Sierra Leone has a terrible reputation. Most people who have heard of the country think only of the rebel war of the 1990s and now perhaps also Ebola, uh, whereas in reality it's incredibly peaceful and quiet. It's poor and beaten up, obviously, um, but from a political risk point of view, from a security point of view, we have absolutely no concerns. You know, generally democratic, peaceful, stable, etc., etc. And to illustrate that, I don't know if anybody's seen the Global Peace Index of 2017, the, the 2017 edition, Sierra Leone is ranked at number 39, fully two places more peaceful than the United Kingdom. <laughs> and that will surprise everybody, but it actually makes sense. I mean, Sierra Leone, they have you know, practically no violent crime. There's no elevated risk of terrorism, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And by the way, you, the United States weighs in at number 114. So risk is very much about perspective, and, and Sierra Leone suffers from that. Uh, so just, very briefly, in, in Sierra Leone, we established a, uh, a rice operation, a rice farming, milling, and, and sales operation. Uh, despite being a small country, Sierra Leone imports fully $350 million worth of rice every year. It's their staple diet. A Sierra Leonean will eat rice typically three times a day. Uh, from a natural endowment point of view, the country is perfect for growing rice. But for all the reasons we know about, uh, there is practically no commercial agriculture. So it is an exciting opportunity. And, and we built uh, a, our operation starting in October 2014. And happily, we're now unquestionably the largest rice milling operation in the country. We're still very small, the sector being dominated by imports. Um, but we're easily number one. And that's exciting for us because that means we have the platform for capturing a, a decent portion of that import substitution opportunity uh, as, as we grow the business and, and raise money and so on. So uh, it, we think that's proof of concept. You know, as I say, we think there's an exciting opportunity in these neglected countries, but the obstacle is this perception problem. Uh, from our perspective, the in-country challenges, you know, the day-to-day -day frictions and hassles of trying to set up a business in a poor country, uh, they exist clearly, but they're not an existential threat to the, the, the business. You know, I mean, we're prepared for the power going off literally every day, you know, for the lack of qualified staff, and you know, just all the usual challenges that you have in a poor country. You know, we can cope with those. Easily, the single biggest obstacle for us has been overcoming the perception problem, 
uh, in other countries in respect of raising finance. I, I mean, the ignorance that, that you know, we encounter in, about Africa generally, frankly, but especially post-conflict countries in Africa, truly amazing. And it's exacerbated by some very, very irresponsible media coverage, especially, for example, during the Ebola epidemic. You know, some profoundly uh, irresponsible coverage. And let me say, from our perspective, the Ebola epidemic was uh, uh, more of a media emergency than an actual emergency. Uh, I, I, as far as I'm concerned, the, the economic damage was not done by the virus itself, but by the overreaction to the virus, fueled by irresponsible media coverage. You know, companies cutting investments, pulling out expat management teams, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so overcoming this um, perception problem is, is easily our single biggest challenge. Right. But the time is short, so I need to get you on to your third, the, cr the crucial, the answer. My, my partial solution, which I hope we'll come back to later, is I, I must say, and I'm deeply aware that I'm sitting next to Diana, but I must say, in my view, I think the DFIs could be doing more uh, for fragile states by behaving more like venture capital players rather than regular private sector, you know, regular private equity investors, because in fragile states, it's all about startups. You know, there is a paucity of corporate assets that a private equity investor would recognize as a vehicle into which they can deploy capital. And the way they're set up at the moment, uh, DFIs generally can't do the small ticket sizes and early stage projects that, that are necessary. So I think the single biggest, most valuable thing the commission could do would be to lobby all of the relevant governments to change the remits that they give their DFIs to allow them to behave or require them to behave more like venture capital players rather than regular private equity investors. Thank you. Brilliant. Well, actually, Diana's paper covers that, so you're, you're not going to be fighting, you're going to be agreeing <laughs> violently with each other, uh, which, is, which is very good news. Thank you for that. Next um, is uh, Hisham El Kazinda, co-founder and managing director of Koala Holdings. Uh, very warm welcome. Great to have you here. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. I'm very impressed, Mr. Cameron, with your pronunciation of my last name. <laughs> People stumble on that. The perspective I, I hope to share with you today is uh, that uh, one that uh, comes from the trenches. So uh, uh, my, the company I co-founded, Color Holdings, uh, started out as a private equity company, but we evolved into an investment holding company. We're based in Cairo, Egypt. Egypt is uh, where, where most of our businesses are located, but we're also active in uh, Sudan, South Sudan, uh, Algeria, Kenya, Uganda, Ethiopia, so essentially North Africa, East Africa. We've operated in Iraq, uh, in Syria uh, in the past, um, and have deployed during the past 13 years since our inception um, just over $9 billion in debt and equity. So we're I believe one of the largest players in, in our part of the world. And what we do doesn't fall quite uh, under the private equity category. This is why we evolved into a holding company. We invest primarily in developing and building and owning large infrastructure type, greenfield infrastructure type projects across the geographies where we operate. Our largest one is a $3.7 billion refinery we've built in Egypt, but uh, we've invested and continue to invest in uh, power generation, gas distribution, railway operations, uh, river transportation, uh, agriculture, and in the process have, you know, in the process of operating in these geographies that at different points in time, I think fall under the fragility definition. Whether you look at Egypt, uh, my home country, certainly during the period from uh, January 2011, uh, you know, the beginning of the Arab Spring, until at least uh, mid-2013, if not beyond, uh, I'd argue Egypt is out of that phase now, to a place like South Sudan, uh, where you know, we've operated and invested since uh, they declared their independence in 2011 and throughout the civil war in 2013. Um, and across these geographies and this time, we've had some fantastic successes, but also some clear failures. And out of these, uh, uh, um, uh, in to, to go back to the third, to go directly to the question posed by Mr. Cameron, you know, the key lessons learned or the key recommendations or what could be different from our perspective uh, uh, revolve around two axes. One is, uh, you know, this commission had a session on effective government uh, and effective building, effective capacity within government. And, and I want to challenge 
the focus of building state capacity uh, because very often it tends to be focused on state capacity when it comes to delivering basic health, basic education, basic law and order. But I would argue that some of the most challenging environments we've dealt with, and again, Egypt in 2011, 2012 is one, it's one of those, is where because of lack of capacity, government is, because as a result of purges, civil servants have been, having been uh, changed, uh, uh, there being an effective paralysis in governments, and governments being simply civil servants, being simply unable to make decisions, being unwilling to sign off on a very standard license or permits or company establishment papers. Uh, so, so just as important, I think, in dealing with the issue of uh, uh, building state capacity, just as important from my perspective as, as basic health or basic education, is also to come up with innovative solutions uh, to support government, civil service in, in fragile countries in being able to be responsive to the private sector uh, and providing the basic services related to regulating, uh, 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 partnering as the case may be with the private sector. And I think that, that includes things such as uh, um, uh, training, you know, providing grants, providing training for uh, civil servants, uh, in some cases uh, providing consulting, consulting supports for these governments uh, um, that often might have the will to you know, have an incentive and a will to support private investment, but simply don't have the capacity to do so. The second one goes back to uh, DFIs and the points raised by, uh, uh, by Paddy and that I'm sure Diana will, will elaborate on. A significant part of the financing we've deployed in those greenfield projects in the geographies where we operate has come from development finance institutions and expert credit agencies partnering with us. So we worked with literally everybody. You know, we worked extensively with the IFC, European Investment Bank, African Development Bank, Japanese Bank of International Cooperation, OPEC in the US, you name it. You know, they've invested, they've either put in debt with us uh, or equity with us. One of the few exceptions is CDC. Uh, you know, we, we always joke about that. <laughs> but, <laughs> but the, you know, were it not for the role uh, that uh, the DFIs have played, uh, we, would, you know, we would have ended up doing a fraction of what, what we've done. So, so I will build on the point that Paddy make. Not so much, uh, you know, I don't think that DFIs are not doing enough. I think they could be doing more. Okay. If, if they were getting uh, the kind of flexibility, uh, increased balance sheets, uh, broadened mandates uh, that, in my view, they ought to get from the, multi the national governments or multinational organizations that depend on. And what worries me is that the moods of overall you know, retrenchment, anti-globalization that we're going through right now is actually translating into DFIs having their budgets uh, and their capacities cut down at the point in time where exactly the opposite should be happening. I'll leave it at that to stick with your time limits and leave it for the conversation. Absolutely, really helpful. And thank you. Your um, memo to us, uh, the, the, the failures were as fascinating as yes. the successes, and it was really great of you to sort of set them out. I think it gives us a lot of things to, to ask you, and, and, and thanks for that. Right, next is going to be um, Neil Gregory, Head of Thought Leadership. Lead us in our thoughts. <laughs> Pleasure to be here with everybody, particularly to be here with, with one of our clients and also with a company that's not yet an IFC client, but we'll see. Um, and also, I think this is a very critical juncture for us to be having this, this conversation. As, as Mary mentioned uh, on the part of MEGA, the same is true for IFC, that we have now received an allocation from the, the either replenishment of, of grant money which we can use to expand our ability to take risk and to do more in fragile countries. And so this is a time when we, we really have the challenge in front of us to now step up and res respond to that opportunity. And so we, over the last year, have been taking stock of what we've done over many years of trying to work in these countries and what has prevented us from doing more. And so we have a longer report, which we'll be happy to share with the Commission. And we're working with uh, the IGC on some country case studies at the moment. So just a, a few remarks, and, and I will get to the question about what will it take for us to do more at, at the end. 
Um, firstly, I think we all agree that economic activity matters for peace and stability and that exclusion from opportunity fuels a lot of the, the dynamics for conflict. And we know that the private sector can play an important role in uh, contributing to, to peace and stability. But it's important that business plays this role by operating in a conflict-sensitive way. It's important that businesses think carefully about how their operations affect the conflict dynamics and play into uh, the politics of the situation. What we have found is that the private sector does show a lot of resilience and finds ways to operate in these fragile situations. But it's not just that things are more difficult for business, but I think as the earlier interventions pointed out, you actually have to do business differently in these contexts. So what we see is that business tends to invest less, there's less capital intensive things, it has shorter value chains, simpler uh, business models, um, and there are distorted incentives for the way uh, that, that companies operate. So because business does, works differently, I think we as investors also have to work differently in these environments. So one of the biggest challenges for us is often that there's many fewer sponsors to work with because fewer companies have, have stayed in that environment. And the opportunities there are to invest, we have less knowledge and information on which to base our credit risk assessment. And so for us, we've come to the realization that we really have to be willing to take more risk and really learn by doing. And in fact, the key role we think for the DFIs is by doing the first investment, there's actually a process of knowledge discovery that nobody knows what the risk is of investing in these environments. But if we do the first investment, Whatever the track record is, that gives the data points and over time multiple data points to other investors to see what the actual risks are. Because I think I, you know, I agree very much with the comment that in many cases risk perceptions lag reality or are not aligned with reality. So I think a key role that we can play is just by going in and doing the first investments in an industry uh, or a country that we start to give some concrete examples of what can uh, be done in these environments. Um, I think that. Uh, in these environments, while it's important to try and work on the regulatory reform and all the sort of the doing business agenda, we also find that what our clients tell us in many cases is that the formal rules don't really apply in many cases because government capacity to enforce them is weak. And so we have to think differently about the way you work with government. Lack of government capacity is a key constraint. So sometimes it's about our clients and the companies need to step in for that lack of capacity, but in a way which doesn't crowd out the restoration of that capacity and in a way which doesn't add to uh, conflict dynamics, as I mentioned earlier. So, so let me come to the, the question of what we can uh, do more. So the first thing is that we need to take more risk, and we hit, we've heard this many times, and that is the rationale for why we sought this $2 billion of uh, either capital which sits alongside our balance sheet so there's a certain amount of risk we can take on our balance sheet and then there are additional risks which this either allocation will take. It will take foreign exchange risk which we usually can't hedge in these markets. It can take government performance risk through guarantees supplementing the kind of guarantees that MEGA offers. It can pay down some of the upfront costs that a business takes by being the first investor. Paul Collier talked about the pioneering investor costs. So through blended finance structures, we can put some grant money alongside our commercial money into a structure so that can tip the balance to make something commercially investable, um, which should help this challenge of there not being enough uh, bankable projects that you heard about a moment ago. We agree there aren't enough companies to invest in, so venture capital and new startups is important. So for about the last eight years, we've been running a program called SME Ventures, because the DFIs themselves are not really fit for purpose to do venture capital. But what we can do is we can see the venture capital industry. So what we do in SME Ventures is we actually go out and recruit fund managers and train them to run venture capital funds. So we've, we've done this now um, in 13 FCS countries. We have nine funds today. We're going to expand that to 20 funds over the coming years. What can uh, our shareholders and stakeholders do to help us do even more? Um, I think two things uh, I would point to. One is that um, uh, Tim had asked me earlier, what's, the f you know, what's your screening process for deciding whether to invest? And the first screen, and I'm sure it's the same for CDC and MEGA, is the sponsor screen. Is this a sponsor that we can work with? We call it integrity due diligence. And a lot of sponsors in these fragile environments fall at the first hurdle there. And this is a question, not of financial risk appetite, this is reputational risk appetite. And this is something, 
you know, I know you've had to deal with that from the DFID side as well, and we all deal with it. But I think, you know, for the shareholders, you have to think about what is your risk appetite, not in terms of capital, but that reputational risk, which all of us share. If this investment ends up on the front page of the Daily Mail, then, you know, what appetite do we have for that to happen? That is what constrains us from working with more sponsors in these countries. And then the second thing, be no surprise to those of you who know that we have limits to our capital base. We haven't had a capital increase from our shareholders since 1992. So obviously, if we had more capital, we'd be able to take more risk on our balance sheet. So I'll leave it there. Thank you very much indeed. That was really helpful. Um, uh, next is James Mwanga, Mwangi from um, Equity Group Holdings. Very warm uh, welcome. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, just uh, to uh, put things in perspective, Equity uh, Group uh, provides financial services, banking, finance, uh, insurance, brokerage, and uh, such services in uh, six countries, Kenya, Uganda, Rwanda, Tanzania, South Sudan, and DRC Congo. So you can see uh, we are operating in what one would call really fragile uh, states. Uh, but I see uh, fragile states uh, really as an opportunity for uh, the private sector uh, uh, because then uh, you could lay foundations. Uh, and uh, in some of the, the countries, you could be able to price uh, the risk, and uh, some of them you can mitigate. We are beneficiaries of. Uh, uh, the mega guarantees both in South Sudan and uh, DLC. So there are those instruments that uh, you can easily use. Uh, we can say we have been very um, successful in the sense that uh, we have built up uh, a company with a balance sheet in excess of $5 billion and a profit of about $200 million annually uh, within those fragile states. But the business model uh, we have been forced to, to tweak it uh, to be more inclusive, to have more social impact, uh, so as to uh, completely engage with the society. And we have economists debating uh, what is the greater value of equity. Is it economic value or social value? And there is a school of thought that uh, the social value of equity may be up to 70% uh, of the total value. So uh, the business model is very, very critical. We have embedded, for instance, uh, the strategic uh, development goals, all of them in the business model, such that you can have scale and you can have sustainability uh, in implementation. Before that, uh, uh, it was uh, the corporate social responsibility embedded. Uh, and just to give an example, we have about uh, 14,000 orphans that we are seeing through in secondary schools. We have about uh, 6,000 orphans in uh, universities. And we have trained uh, about 1.7 million women and youth on financial literacy and entrepreneurship skills. So capacity building within fragile states uh, is very critical. Uh, what would make us do much better? I think uh, the, the biggest uh, um, contribution will be lowering of uh, sovereign risk, uh, achieving greater stability and predictability particularly in the microeconomic environment. For instance, we were very successful in South Sudan over a period of five years, but over the last uh, uh, three years, everything we had built uh, has uh, been destroyed. We had uh, up to 400 uh, members of staff, uh, South Sudanese, now we have only 84. Uh, we had 11 branches uh, spread all over, but we now have uh, four. And it's not that we chose most of them to cross, it's that they were banded down. So essentially, then uh, you really pull. We have seen this not just uh, in um, South Sudan. The second uh, um, factor that can make us really uh, do better is where our leadership can be supported to become stronger and transformational. Uh, we are doing extremely well in uh, uh, Luanda. And when you look at uh, why we are uh, performing that very well, it's a strength of leadership uh, in that country. So that uh, there is clear direction, there is clear focus, and the country moves out uh, uh, pr uh, pretty fast, so uh, stabilizing. I think we have also seen we can do much better if there was greater public-private partnerships. The reason that we were able to spread uh, from Kenya was an investment of uh, $175 million. <laughs> 
uh, from Helios, uh, private equity fund. But if you look uh, deeper into it and uh, I'll remove the veil, you see it was IFC, you to see it was uh, CDC. So essentially, that private-public partnerships. And now we have extended a little bit to do particularly with um, uh, UNDP, uh, DFID here, uh, USID of US government. Uh, to come and particularly social payments. You really provide this social payment. And what in the process you do, you create supply chains, you create value chains that tries to create ecosystem where everybody has skin in the game or in the economy. And you start seeing uh, peace on its own building following these value chains that uh, you have been able to create. Because of time, let me close by uh, saying regional um, or continental supranational bodies like uh, East African Community, EGAD, African Union, we have found them to be good anchors uh, to mediate, uh, particularly with local leadership. You find sometimes uh, private sector institutions are weak to approach leadership, but you can use these organizational structures uh, that are of a regional nature uh, to, uh, to get into them. And last week, globally, maybe we need to consider some aspects of exemptions on regulations. We find we have not been able, although the government of um, uh, Somari has been uh, maybe to my office for about 10 times, we have not been able to get to uh, uh, Somari, and we can, there is a business case, but we fear more uh, the anti-money laundering and uh, such regulations because you'll be listed on the UN. We have seen it has been a big problem operating also in uh, Eastern DRC, the mining regions. So you are very wary who you can touch because you don't know who tomorrow will be listed. And then uh, again, your network of relationship, commercial relationship, uh, then become threatened. So th there may be need uh, that uh, large uh, operators in such areas, either given some accommodation uh, on understanding that it's not deliberate, it's not conscious, but it may be because of, we have for instance now uh, an, a bulletin latest issued by UN, and you find four uh, South Sudanese uh, who had accounts with us are on the list. So yes, you report, but if it is uh, reported wrongly, then you could be in trouble. So those are accommodations that could be that, that last point is, is something that hasn't come up actually in this uh, context, but I think we need to examine that in the questions a bit more because I think it's a very interesting um, avenue. Last but not least, thank you very much, Diana Noble. A superb note you've, thundering note you've given us, uh, which is just what we uh, need, coming to some of the same conclusions as, as Paddy about, um, uh, about venture capital. But um, let's have five minutes from you and then we'll, we'll go to the questions. What I'm going to do for the questions is to warn my fellow commissioners. I think what we'll do is we'll take everyone in tone. I will ask a dumb question to sort of get, or, or that comes from what they've said, sort of just to get them to open up on, on one or two key subjects. And then if you're all ready to come in behind, and I think we'll go through the subjects sort of in the order they've been round, and then that will bring some logic uh, to it. Um, and just to sort of get you prepared, I think, you know, I've been asking so far what would enable you to do more of what you do. I think the other question we're trying to answer today is, look, clearly the functioning state, the basic security, that is the first essential. But I think the thing we're trying to get to is, well, what comes, what, what, what comes next in terms of, is it access to finance, is it ability to, is it infrastructure? What comes next? What matters the most? And where can we make the biggest difference there? So if you sort of have that in your mind as we go to the next round. Um, okay. Uh, well, it's an absolute pleasure to be here. This is a topic that's very dear to my heart. Uh, and... I think the, the whole topic of trying to do more in hard places we made central to the CDC journey over the last six years while, uh, while I was there. And I think we made a lot of progress over the last six years, but I do approach, I think this is a topic that needs humility in approaching it. Um, partly because, um, I, well, from a personal point of view, there are many people in this room who have looked at CDC for a far longer period, Paul, Manoush, than, than I was there, and probably know a great deal more than I do. Uh, but also, six years is actually a pretty short time in this world, in this investing world. Frankly, it felt like a long time, six years, <laughs> to me personally, but um, it's not long enough to prove any case in terms of a strategy being successful. Yes, we definitely moved the 
needle dramatically in terms of the proportion of investments in really hard places and the risk appetite that we were prepared to take. But the results are definitely not through yet. And there are a number of DFIs who would probably privately and publicly say, oh, CDC is taking plenty of risk here. So let's not um, say that it's successful yet. Okay. Um, so if I just focus the, the five minutes on trying to look at the question of um, why don't uh, DFIs do more? in really hard places. Because I think in trying to answer the key question of what more can be done, I think you have to understand what are, the, what are actually the constraints today. And I think I felt certainly uh, during my time at CDC that we were able to, under the governance and architecture and ownership structure that we have, move the risk appetite a long way, but there are definitely constraints to that. And I think it's good to put those constraints on the table. So I think the first constraint is, is the one everyone understands, which, which is the need for positive financial returns. Every single DFI uh, has that in their uh, agreement with their providers of capital, um, and it's at a portfolio, uh, on a portfolio basis, so you have to take a portfolio approach by necessity, so the <coughs> very risky investments you make, you have to balance out with um, other investments that look less risky, and therefore to say that you could put all of your portfolio in really, really hard places, that wouldn't, that definitely wouldn't work. And to run a DFI, I would say, um, is a life of perpetual paranoia. <laughs> Between, am I creating enough impact, and am I able to show that, which is absolutely at the core of your mission, but am I pushing that risk appetite too far that the returns won't come through and we'll end up with a very troubled portfolio. So, and if you're a hi your study of the history of CDC, who has been doing this longer than anyone since 1948, it absolutely has lurched between the two different extremes. And what we are trying, we were trying to do is put it right at the centre of the road of taking as much risk as we possibly could, but protecting the financial returns. So, of course, one of the things you could do is say reduce the financial return requirement to allow you to take more risk. And of course that can be done, but, and it's the easiest thing, but alone it's definitely not enough. So the second thing you have to look at is the team. Does the team have the skills? And particularly, does it want to make these kinds of really hard investments in the very hardest places? Um, and in this introduction, let's just look at the motivations bit, because I think that's a part that's quite uh, ignored by uh, observers of, the, uh, <coughs> of, of DFIs. So um, teams in DFIs are investment professionals, uh, and they're really good at judgment. Uh, they would be in IFC, and they would be in Hisham's uh, organization as well. They're really good at uh, judgments about where to invest and where not to invest. And their motivation is to make uh, to make good investments, and that's their professional pride. Investment professionals and DFIs are not motivated by personal financial gain. They've already made that decision to discount themselves to come and do this. It's not about uh, mm -hmm. becoming rich. You don't join a DFI to do that. But there is a line that they won't cross in terms of risk appetite, both personally and at the investment co committee, and that's because failures are really tough. So failures don't just happen overnight. Um, you can put years of effort trying to rescue something that's in a death spiral. Uh, and it's pretty miserable laying off workers and laying, trying to change management teams and laying off workers that probably then won't get another job if they're working in, you know, in living in the, hardest, uh, in the hardest places. And you also, as an investor, you lose confidence. You know, and boy, you need confidence to make risky investments too. Um, and so to change a DFI's mandate to make investments, and you know, I understand the point about DFI should be like a venture capitalist that is making lots of uh, investments that are risky and the good ones will pay off for the bad ones. I think, you know, I would say two things. Firstly, you know, the whole history of investing in Africa shows that there aren't the winners to compensate for the failures from a financial point of view. There are no Googles that have emerged you know, in Africa. And secondly, um, 
not many people working in DFIs would be up for a mandate that says you're going to have more failures than successes, just because it's personally very, very hard. Um, the, other, the next area is the um, structural architecture of, uh, of DFIs. And in lots of ways, the success measures are diametrically opposed to what is needed for this kind of investing. Um, so DFIs have big balance sheets, and everyone has investment targets, the amount of money that actually goes out, out the door. And so that makes it almost impossible to make uh, small investments directly. And if there's a long lead time to making an investment, which there is for a startup, then you have to be pretty sure about that the ticket is going to be a big one, which is why you see DFIs focusing on infrastructure projects, because those are big, big tickets. Um, also, there is huge pressure on DFIs for what is called value for money. And that comes from their owners, and it comes from uh, taxpayers as well, which says the cost of your team to manage your balance sheet needs to be as small as possible. Whereas this kind of investing is about people, cost, and small tickets. And so the incentives are, uh, are wrong. So at the moment, DFIs are incented to keep teams relatively lean and busy on investments that are actually going to happen. And the final point I'll make, and this may be a little bit controversial, is I think for this type of investing, if you were going to have a team and an organization that is focused on the very hardest bit of the market, personally, I think governments aren't the right owners for those institutions. Um, I feel that governments have, uh, and politicians, have unrealistic expectations of time frames. Um, I've got plenty of stories of being, of being asked you know, whether the, the very hardest bit of our mission, bef when we just put some people into country to learn about it, weren't even making investments yet, was asked by a very clever minister, but his first question was, is Frontier failing? <laughs> you know, and uh, we won't know for 10 years, 15 years, certainly not after a few months. Um, I think the, the change of people in governments all the time make it very difficult, difficult to have a consistent strategy and a consistent approach to markets through ups and downs and failures. I think that's difficult. Um, this is the highest risk uh, type of investing you can do in the world, both in terms of capital and certainly in terms of reputation as well. And uh, doing that in the harsh spotlight of government ownership and taxpayer money is very, very challenging and definitely is a constraint to uh, what DFIs are prepared to do. So um, I'm sure we can expand on these themes. Thank you. Um, that was excellent. Thank you all, by and large, stuck to the time, which thanks very much. Um, so I'm going to ask sort of a question to, to, to each one, and then after that, if my fellow commissioners want to pile in with, with um, questions and points they've got. But look, I think really good um, pointers too. So I was going to um, uh, start with with you, Murdy, if I could. Just, just I mean, the, the clear conclusion when I asked you the question, <coughs> what stops you doing more of what you want to do? And you said it's the shortage of bankable projects. Um, it may, this is a bit of a dumb question, but what is the, what are the best ways of unlocking more bankable projects? What are the things that either aid agencies, governments themselves, uh, institutions should be doing to increase the capacity of countries to produce investable projects? Well, that's a great question. <laughs> I mean, I, I think, um, I think, you know, there's a lot, there's a lot going on, and there's a lot of good work going on. I think the challenge is very great, and partially it gets to the the question. One of the questions that you were talking about, which is, you know, what is the one thing that we can do to change things? And I think there is no one thing. That's part of the problem. You know, there's a governance issue, and I guess what you just heard, and which I, I I've experienced myself, there's a governance issue in the in the fragile and conflict-affected states, and then there's a governance issue within the institutions that are trying to support these these uh, these states. That and uh, and we could look to solve, try and solve the governance issue in the fragile and conflict-affected states, but 
and that I think I, we heard from a number of speakers, but then the question becomes, well, perhaps there's not the infrastructure to, in these countries to support private investors coming in. You know, there's not the road there that's built yet. There's not the power. There's no power in the country, or the power shortages are too great, and therefore, um, you know, the, the private sector would like to come in, but it's just not going to be a profitable project unless there's sufficient power there. So um, there's a, a whole host of, of factors that have to come into play. You know, there has to be the, some kind of relative stability in the country in terms of political risk. There has to be some kind of governance structure and legal structure to, uh, to have contracts that investors can have confidence in. There has to be uh, some kind of basic uh, infrastructure in place to have these, these uh, projects uh, work. So all of these factors have to come together. And I think another point uh, that, that I would agree with also is um, time has to pass. There has to be a track record. Yeah. You know, it can't just be, you know, things come together for, you know, a year or two years or three years and investors are just going to start uh, uh, finding that country to be an attractive investment location. I think you, 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 the, the problem is time. It does take time. And uh, uh, you have to establish a track record and build confidence over time. And um, that, that, can, that can be difficult. Other questions for Murdy? Does anyone else want to, to come in? Paul? Yeah. Um, as I understand it, please correct me if I'm wrong, um, MEGA recovers <coughs> from governments most of the money it pays out to investors for claims. Um, and um, so in a way, um, it's less of an insurance company than a, a, an ex a sort of ex post, sort of thing, yeah. yeah, an ex post governance correction agency, um, and so I just wondered whether you should move into ex ante um, prevention of governance mistakes because what what I tend to hear is that um, uh, just sort of getting the insurance cover is not enough. We just want a safer environment, less political risk, and since you're in the business of correcting, as it were, the political risks that get called, where governments make a mistake, and then you get the governments to pay back for that, do you think you could extend from the ex post correction to the ex ante and say, look, governments, you, you need to build some systems to, to prevent these sort of mistakes, which you then have to pay up on? Well, that, that's a great question. I mean, first of all, Mika has a very low claims rate, so I mean, we, we only need to go to governments very rarely to collect on our insurance contracts. I just want to make sure that's understood. But we do work now. If there is a problem in one of our projects, we are on it immediately, and we are actively trying to play the honest broker between uh, the, the government and, and the private sector participant. So that's a role that, we're, that we spend enormous amount of time on. Sometimes we find almost upon signing a contract that uh, some kind of difficulty arises and the project is in immediate difficulty. And we immediately uh, get on a plane and try and uh, work out the problem. And we have a very low claims rate uh, that we do need to collect from governments on because we are very active in, in the role of of trying to solve the problem. And very, very often we do solve the problem and we're successful in that. But of course the whole development community and the World Bank as well are actively trying through advisory work, through their loans from IDA or grants from IDA to try and work on these, on these basic issues around um, macro stability around business environment. IFC tries to do quite a bit on that, and around the financing framework. So that is work that's being done uh, by our sister institutions and, of course, by other development institutions as well. So that work is being done ex ante. It's just difficult work. Thank you. A factual point. Most of the projects you support, obviously, by their very nature, are quite big. Is there, do you have a product where you can break it up and, for smaller projects, provide sort of simple, easy to get cover, or does that not work? No, we, we, we have no size limit, you know, size limit. So we will go for the smallest project if, if, if 
if that project, and we do, and we have a small <coughs> projects uh, program that we work on. Yeah, Nora, thank you. Actually, <coughs> being, um, <coughs> we, we, we use MEGA for one of our projects, and one thing I would just say about MEGA, which I found interesting, maybe this can be copied or probably copied in other people, is that they sent evaluation committees. Uh, to which which puts a lot of constraint. I mean, being the private sector, it puts a lot of constraint on the private sector to ensure that your, you know, the social impact is correct, the environment policies are in place, and uh, uh, everything else that you've basically said in your uh, in your in your um, submission to actually get the guarantee is mm. in place. And I think that's one of the most important things because we see a lot of private sector where after they get actually the funding, they don't. Um, commit to what they have said, especially when it comes to the social and environment right. policy. So in fact, it's a useful public yeah. policy function as well yeah. as the insurance function. Yeah. Got it. Yes, thank you for that. Of course, this is very important to us and also for IFC. We have our, our standards when it comes to um, sustainability issues with respect to the environment, with respect to social standards, and also with respect to um, the governance and integrity standards of, of, of the project. So this is uh, a major uh, added value of, the, of working with MIGA and, of course, working with the IFC as well. Mm -hmm. So, so I, want, I want to tie this a little bit to things that were said uh, by, by Paddy uh, as well. But um, what, does MIGA have too low a claims rate, meaning that you know, if you're really lending to a range, to a vast range of risky projects, it might actually be good news that you're getting more claims because you're probably lending at a larger scale to a wider range of projects. I'm wondering, and particularly when you just added the comment about your your standards for environmental health, of course those are things we love and we think it's great, <coughs> but they're also inhibiting in environments that are already incredibly difficult places to operate. And I wonder whether that has something to do with the governance. That's why it's coming back to I mean, while this is in the hands of an international organization with its accountability structures, maybe this is just too inhibiting a, a, an environment in which to be providing products that are going to do the work that the private sector needs. And, and uh, admirable though it is, I just, I just wonder, and I, I know it's awkward for you to comment on that, but I, 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 it's a concern I have listening to the yeah. discussion. That's great, what I'm great I say really that's, a, that's a, a question you have to put to our shareholders. We are responding to what our shareholders want us to do. They want us to go into these risky places, but as I think you've already heard, they don't want us to be on the front page of a newspaper. You know, they want us to go into our risky places, but they don't want us to have any losses. They, you know, want us to uh, work in risky places where someone mentioned it takes enormous amount of time, but they want us to hit our targets for for issuing guarantees for this year. So there are all these variety of pressures that uh, our, our share, we're trying to meet our shareholder demands. Yes, they want to have us have very high standards for integrity, for, uh, for social policies in our projects, and for environmental policies, and that takes time and requires a, a fairly sophisticated environment in which we're operating. Sort of risk accountability problem, mm -hmm. which again, the issue we haven't thought about at all up to now, which is great. This is really, um, Manoush, you want to come in and then I'm going to move on to questions to Paddy. Just to be <coughs> provocative, um, in, in normal business, you take higher risk, you get a higher return. In this context, you take higher risk, but you get a lower return most of the time. If you look at the portfolios of most of the DFIs in fragile states, they get a lower return in fragile states than they do in other emerging markets. That's just a fact. Um, so if you were being really provocative, you would say, well, maybe we shouldn't be asking DFIs to operate in these countries, and that public money should be used for public sector projects. And where we know what the rates of return are. You can make 50% rate of return on a road in most developing countries. You can make 25% rate of return on a water project in most developing countries, probably even in most fragile states, just with you know, sort of old-fashioned basic infrastructure with private contractors coming in and building it. So I said I'm being provocative. Mm. So, and, and so you could make an argument that the real value of public money is in that kind of much more traditional activity rather than trying to facilitate private sector development. The only argument against that would be if you could persuade us that there's lots of externalities that we're not capturing somehow in these rates of return, 
of having the pioneer private project, which then enables other mm. investors to come in and so forth. So I just wanted you to react to that line of argument. Hmm. Neil? I come on this point, great question. Um, I would distinguish between the rate of return that we earn after all our operating costs and the actual rate of return of the investment. I think I would agree that in these post-conflict environments, often there are good investment opportunities and the, the investee company can make good returns. I don't want to give the impression that there aren't good investment opportunities. What's difficult for us as a DFI is, you know, one, that they're smaller scale, and two, that we have this high cost structure of trying to process them, dealing with all the screening we have to do for integrity, environmental and social, having people on the ground in those countries, which is the only way to manage the risks and do investments of those things, is very high cost. So one thing to think about is whether the shareholders or donors or others are willing to defray those extra operating costs so that what are fundamentally good investments at the project uh, level can, can go ahead. Uh, you know, I think you know, the other thing is that on the externality side that we think that one of the biggest external benefits is this resetting of people's risk perceptions. That that first investment that we can do as a DFI if we're able to carry the cost and take the risk and do it is what gives the data points to others to understand what the real risk is. Because often risk perceptions are highly lagged or they're just that they have no data points on which to base their risk metrics. So until somebody goes in and does the first investment, who knows how risky it is and what their risk adjusted return is. So for me that's one of the biggest externalities that is hard to capture in a you know in a, in a rate of return calculation, but I think it's a critical role that we can play. Any but yeah, I can do one. Yes, but my, do so my mind was going a very similar direction to yours, Manoush, in terms of, you know, I believe that the, the DFIs do great work and we shouldn't mess too much with sort of the governance structures and what we ask them to do, with the exception of saying, go as far as you can go in terms of risk appetite within you know what your shareholders are asking you to do but that definitely does create a gap for someone and it's not just risk appetite it's also I suppose what I would call business building skills in very hard places there aren't many of those around the world but if you could create something either within an existing institution or even as a new institution with the right ownership, the right governance structure, the right expectations about timeframes, returns, etc., and the right skills to fill that particular space, I think, I think you're going to get more um, out of that than trying to push the DFIs beyond right. their comfortable that, that leads directly to the question I was going to ask Paddy, because I think this is where we're getting to the nub of it, which is, I was going to ask him really, you, you've spoken about this need for sort of smaller scale venture capital, which is what Diana was just referring to, and you've just said, Diana, maybe there's a, a new, there's something new that needs to be created, but I wanted to ask Paddy, how, how do you think this small scale venture capital should be delivered? Is it the uh, the IFIs enabling others to do it? Is it them branching out and funding it directly? Is it something else? What is the right mechanism? Because we've got to, at the end of the day, we've got to write a report with some <coughs> suggestions for mechanisms and means of delivering these changes. What, what would, if you had a magic wand, what would it be? So, uh, I <coughs> defer obviously to Diana's superior expertise in this area, but from my perspective, I think the, the DFIs have the existing uh, structure. Uh, you know, to make investments in these countries, you know they have, they have the money, they have the, the teams, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, so my feeling, um, of course, I know what Diana says, but my feeling is that with changed instructions, you know, with a changed remit, <coughs> um, perhaps even changed teams. I mean, if it is a team issue, you know, maybe you need people from a VC background staffing, um, CDC, uh, CDC and other DFIs. I don't know. But that seems to me to be the existing structure for, uh, for unleashing that capital, because they have the capital, and it's deeply frustrating to me as a, an entrepreneur working in, uh, in Sierra Leone, which is the, one of the poorest countries in the world, and unquestionably in the British remit. I mean, we have a responsibility to Sierra Leone. You know, it was, it's disappointing that CDC hadn't invested, frankly. You know, we, you know, we'd love to have CDC, and it seems a, a natural fit. Um, but for the reasons we've talked about, because we've been too early stage, you know, too 
uh, too small and so on, you know, it hasn't happened. Um, so, you know, I, I think but isn't that, that an argument for separation? I mean, I was just when you were talking, about it, I think it's something he did here in the UK it was um, when the banks weren't lending, we set up something called startup loans, and we gave loans of between three thousand and remember fifteen twenty thousand pounds to people who had a business idea and a business plan, and we measured it on the basis that we were never getting any of this money back. Mm -hmm. So it was literally measured on. I remember going to the Treasury and saying, I'd like to have whatever it was, 100 million of this program, and we were going to spend 100 million on startup loans. And that was the, su the success of the program, was measured by how many loans were given, hoping that in some years' time uh, we'd get some of that money back. But that wasn't the calculation we made. So the incentive of the people in the startup loan organization was totally different to what you have if you've got. Um, I'm simplifying, but I can see. So, in terms of do you want to try and change the DFIs to deliver a program, or do you want to create something new? That is an argument for creating something new. Isn't that? I I, I, I suppose there is, but it seems to me that in many respects the DFIs are largely replicating the work of regular private sector investors. So it doesn't seem to me to be justified that taxpayer assets are, are you know, doing the work of you know, what, what any other private equity investor would do. You know, if they're investing, investing alongside regular private equity players, then why do they exist? I mean, they're doing it less efficiently than the private sector. You know, they need to have that catalytic role in creating new businesses uh, otherwise, I, I'm not quite sure why why they exist. Uh, and, and, and and there are other elements of the the system that that are clearly valuable, like Mega, for example. But to state the obvious, Mega can only ensure a project that exists. Yeah. yeah. Um, you want to come yeah, in? Exactly. I, mean, I think I, mean, I think <coughs> what we are saying is there's there's two things. There's the capital and expertise required to invest in infrastructure. Which, uh, yeah, and there's sort of the ability to deploy capital to come to people who can. <coughs> venture capital to deploy to people, and they're two different things, yeah? Being stuck in the middle, I think, is the no man's land, which I think some DFRs actually have got stuck in, stuck in, basically, sort of competing, as you're saying, competing against, yeah? Um, I think doing the venture capital thing, I think, is such a specialist, it's a very local thing, you know, people in Silicon Valley only invest, in, it's, it's not, you cannot be doing it from far away. Um, so I think that sort of results in saying the DFRs maybe should consider because what you were going earlier, Minush, sort of moving up to doing more of the bigger long-term projects that are long-term with clear return characteristics to them. Was that, was that a question? Yes, I think. Yeah. Sorry, let's hear from Robin and then we'll see if our, <coughs> our so witnesses want to come in on this. I think this relates to the previous question. So if we were building a school, uh, something where you wouldn't expect. I mean, you speak up. That. Sorry. Uh, if you were building a school, a health clinic, you wouldn't expect the kind of returns that you guys are expecting, 7% and so forth. But when it comes to building a road, suddenly we need 7% of electricity grid or whatever. And so it strikes me that, as Manish was saying, maybe you don't get your 7% in a really bad country in the first X years. So would there not be some argument for, and both things we accept probably contribute to poverty reduction and building electricity. <coughs> so then don't you have to kind of face that and say, well, maybe you need to take a cut on the return, uh, at least for some period, so that A, you could invest in a, uh, you know, a larger portfolio in more difficult environments, and B, perhaps you have to do that with some sort of co-investment model so you could seed companies like yours, uh, James is over there. Uh, so that they could, you know, just accept that a lot of that money is not going to, you're not going to get a return on that money, but you are going to create <coughs> projects in these countries at a higher rate than you're currently doing. Because I think there's a sort of a weird distinction between sort of stuff that needs returns and mm -hmm. stuff that doesn't need yeah. returns that yeah. both are important. Who wants to come in on that? Oh, uh, quickly, just yeah. to say that I think there's a lot of um, thinking and innovation going on in this very space. We. People mostly call it blended finance, but basically that is the idea that while we on our balance sheet need a return, the project as a whole may deliver a lower return. So if you blend some commercial money with some grant money, and there are different structures for doing that, first loss structures and different ways of doing it. But basically, I think there's a lot of innovation, a lot of discussion amongst the DFIs on exactly how to do that. And a number of shareholders, including DFID, have been very uh, proactive in actually providing us with, with grant money to do those blended finance structures. Yeah, and if you look at CDC's next five-year strategy, there is an agreement with DFID to give lower return capital 
for some very specific high impact strategies as well. So as, you, as Neil says, there is a lot of experimentation going on here. But Dan, I just want to understand, are you saying potentially your recommendation would be in terms of small scale venture capital, it's because it's so high risk, it's difficult for the DFIs to do. You could potentially set up some new institutions, more locally based, perhaps they might get some funding from other DFIs or from governments and explicitly to take higher risk. Do you think that is that where you think we should go? Yeah, I, I do actually. I mean, I think, you know, you go to any um, fragile <coughs> country and your first question is what's needed? And the answer is a very easy one. Pretty much everything. I showed the uh, statistics in my, in my paper. The much harder question is what is doable? Okay. And to answer that question of what is doable requires people with the right kind of mindset to be integrated in that country because it's going to be different in every single country with the time frame to figure it out, work with the government if necessary, experiment, etc. That's why I put the KTDA Kenya T example in the paper to show it can be done but with a very different mindset uh, than is being deployed in the, uh, in the DFIs at the moment. Cool. Two simple points. One is, I think there's a confusion on what is the risk and what is the return. In, in a fragile state, the risk is not that the project fails, it's that the state fails. Yeah. <laughs> and the return on what you're doing <clears throat> is lowering the risk that the state fails. Yes. <laughs> and everything has to be built around that. Um, that's the objective for all public institutions dealing with fragile states. Are we doing things which uh, are tending to lower the risk of state failure. If, we're, if it lowers the risk of state failure, that's success. If it doesn't lower the risk of state failure, it's failure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, the, my point about, we've, we've got two, we know, what we know now is there's a missing vehicle, as mm -hmm. it were. Money is not flowing to the sort of ventures that would lower risks in fragile states in sufficient quantity. And we don't know how to do it. There are two options. One is you encourage the DFIs to, to go into that territory. The other is you set up new institutions. It's no good trying to work out which of those strategies is better in my view. We don't know. This is an un unknowable unknown. The right thing to do is try them both. We know there's a need. Yes. With two vehicles, we should try them both and see which works better. I, I, I accept that, but I accept that there's, we know that the, these institutions that we have are all under, already under enormous pressures that are unlikely to go away. In fact, they're likely to get worse. Mm -hmm. the, the financial constraints from the shareholders above and the media critique from below, those two things are going to get worse rather than better. So that might move you towards trying something new rather than pushing things in, a, in, in another direction. But, but who knows? We can't, say, we, we, can't, can't, we can't take the view that actually yeah. our populations, our citizens, are really worried about state failure. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so we need to really yeah. emphasize the purpose of these institutions in order to, make them is to reduce state Very good failure, point. not to make money. Very good point. Yeah. Um, I'm going to move to um, some questions to um, Hisham now, um, uh, before asking others to come in. I, I mean, obviously, you've got a very clear recommendation for us. You're saying, uh, look, when you talk about state capability, one of the most important things from the private sector point of view is the capability of that state to interface with the private sector, Correct. to be its counterparty, to issue licenses and permits and all that. It's a very clear thank you for that. My question was a very simple one. Which, well, how should we, um, how should we do that? Is that do you do you think that therefore aid agencies and others should shift their focus in terms of doing helping that bit of government before helping other bits of government, or? Uh, as this actually is something that can be sometimes contracted out to another party, um, uh, you know, could, can you? Is it possible in some failed or recovering failed states actually to set up a brand new licensing institution that might be run by someone completely different? What what advice would you give us as to how to deliver the thing you're most worried about? Um, um, my my reaction to that would be. A concern about uh, setting up entirely new or independent uh, uh, organizations within government, because the concern then would be the, the sustainability of these and them, them coming into attack. Uh, 
so, so I think it's, it's more on the former than the latter. It is how do you support uh, uh, you know, existing ministries, authorities, in, in training their own people, uh, in having the funding to attract the kind of talent locally that you know, they don't need to import it. Sometimes it's there locally, but uh, you, know, you, you, end, you have salary scales that are uh, completely not comparable to those in the private sector, and accordingly, these government authorities are unable to attract the, the, the right talents of people, even with people who are willing to take a discount, as with this is the case with DFIs, you know, who want the security of a state job and want to contribute to society and are willing to forego economic upside in terms of that. But the disparity is so large that, that those, state, those state agencies are simply unable to, to, to attract some of the local talent that they need. So perhaps in terms of grants and funding, for some of these organizations to be used to attract to attract uh, to attract the right people, uh, this is one aspect. Another aspect is, uh, particularly um, in 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 countries um, such you know such as an Egypt or an Ethiopia, uh, you know that have a history of uh, of of uh, uh, very statist, very socialist policies. Uh, training you know retraining civil servants uh, and and perhaps providing them with fellowships opportunities to be exposed uh, you know to how government is run in other uh, more 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 sophisticated jurisdictions is helpful because there are sometimes things that you know uh, you know I've, I've 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 dealt with situations where you're discussing a public private partnership but from your count from your government counterparts perspective the idea that i as a private sector am going to generate a decent return on this is anathema in itself right you know he 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 thinks that whatever profit i'm going to generate actually should have gone to the state as opposed to as opposed to it going to the backers of that project so there is uh, uh, you know some some training and reeducation from a cultural point of view that needs to go that that needs to go in so so support for uh, training uh, fellowships uh, on the one hand grants to be able to provide adequate compensation within these within these authorities is 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 an, it would be another one. That's very helpful. I think I'm training tax inspectors, for instance. So I, I, yeah, that's very helpful. Right, um, Tim. So so can I come in on the the, the last? I think it's the last point you made about the world losing uh, the appetite for uh, investing um, and the retrenchment, which is I found surprising at first sight because one of the things. I, I, I hear when I talk to private investment investors is there's huge amounts of capital out there. It's just a case of finding reliable places in which to deploy that capital. So that seemed a little bit at odds with the mantra of just give us the viable investment opportunities and the capital's going to flow in. And particularly infrastructure is the classic example. No, absolutely. So, 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 so my comment, uh, uh, and perhaps that was not clear in the memo, my comment was specifically on the, 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 the importance from my perspective of DFIs doing more of what they're doing and the sense that uh, uh, those particular types of institutions are under attack or being forced to retrench or unable to expand as they need to do so within their relevant national context or multilateral context. So the comment was not so much about retrenchment in global investments but the sense that DF, you know, within these fragile contexts the role of DFIs is critical, so it's certainly been critical for us. We'd like to, I'd like to see them enabled to be able to do more. And my sense is that that is not that is not always that is not always the case. Let me add a couple of points that are, that are actually follow-ons on some of the comments that were made earlier, and 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 that are sp specific examples. So on on this issue of uh, uh, venture capital and funding, you know, small projects. Some DFIs, and the, and the IFC is an example of that, have as part of their mandate the ability to provide debt and equity fin financing for specific projects, but that also have as part of their mandate investing in venture capital funds and investing in private equity funds. And, and, and certainly, you know, within the ecosystems I've looked at, uh, uh, you know, when I, look at uh, when I look at the Egyptian venture capital ecosystem, it's been, you know, the, the investment of the IFC and a couple of other uh, DFIs of relatively small amounts, you know, in the single-digit million dollars in local VC funds 
has been very, very important in developing the local system. But, but I suspect the IFC is one of the few DFIs that, have the, that has the flexibility to do that. I mean, most other DFIs cannot, in, or many other DFIs, cannot invest in funds, be they uh, late stage investing or early stage investing. So enabling those DFIs, so having an agenda that broadens the mandate of these DFIs so that they all can or are all mandated to do both direct, direct investment in projects as well as having part of their uh, balance sheet directed to seeding private equity funds and seeding VC funds, I think would be an indirect way of achieving uh, uh, some of the objectives you're talking about. I'm going to come on to that with a question for the IFC in a minute. I've got one more question for you before anyone else wants to, to come in. Um, you said you've worked with all the different international financial institutions. I yes. wonder if you had any experience with or reflections on uh, the role that Chinese development banks have been playing in Africa and what prospects you think there are for the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank sure. and whether that will operate differently. Sure. So, 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 so the, the challenge that the, the, uh, the, the China Africa Development Bank or the Chinese Development Bank has is that a, explicitly in their mandate is uh, having significant local contents. You know, it, it has, so the investment that they fund has to have a majority Chinese elements as, as part of it. And, and that has meant that, for example, we haven't been able to work with them so far at least because in the projects that we're doing, we want to be the lead investor and we want to be the, we, we, we would not be comfortable being a minority investor alongside a Chinese state-owned enterprise, for example. And I, think that's, and I think that's a limiting factor. That's also a limiting factor to some extent for uh, an OPIC. Uh, U.S. Overseas Private Investment Corporation. They have a lower threshold. You know, there needs to be a 25% U.S. content. You know, as part of as part of uh, their their men, their, uh, their 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 loans. Uh, but uh, you know, I can understand why, from a from the perspective of these development finance institutions, justifying you know their existence vis-à-vis -vis their local stakeholders. Some of these elements might be necessary. But they create a lot of constraints then on the impact that these institutions can have. From my perspective, the Chinese Development Bank would end up being a lot more effective and ultimately actually serve Chinese interests if they didn't have that, that requirement. And OPEC would be much more active and ultimately also serve potentially U.S. interests if it didn't have those threshold requirements. Okay, very clear answer. Thank you. Other points? Let's go on to, um, on the IFC, and this follows on directly from what you said, you, you said in your talk, um, it, maybe the answer was to receive venture capital funds. I just um, wanted to understand how, again, back to this question, how you think you should go about that. Is that, as Hisham was saying, through what you already do, you you are able to invest in venture capital, private equity funds, um, and maybe other DFI should be able to do the same thing, or have you got something else in mind? So. So we have had a program for about the last 10 years which we're rolling out to more FCS countries. It's currently in 13 FCS countries today, which recognizes that you need to have these venture capital funds, but there currently aren't fund managers there who you can just let the investors as we do in countries like Egypt. So we do two things you know, using some, some donor money to support it. One is we actually go out and run a tendering process, and get first time fund managers to bid to, to, to manage a fund, and then we train those fund managers and we help them develop their skills. So we're actually growing the capacity and of the fund managers in, 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 in individual countries. We've done it in Nepal, we've done it in DRC, we've done it in, in, in a number of West African countries. And then the second thing we do is we also have donor money that goes alongside that venture capital fund, so it can also draw down that money when they invest in a startup company they have some money they can draw on to train the management team of that company. So I think you need to build the management capacity at two levels, the level of the investee companies and at the level of fund managers. So over time, we want to build this cadre of fund managers, and the successful ones will go on to run second and third funds, and then we can go into more countries. And so I you know, absolutely agree with the comment that yeah, I think you know, we need more DFIs to be part of this. Because so you've got a working mechanism. As far as you're concerned, you've got a mechanism that works, you've tried different places, and obviously and we're going to scale with that. Um, other questions for uh, either Hisham or yeah. We're meant to be having the coffee break, but I think actually we should push on through, carry on with questions, and I think we've probably then let all our witnesses 
go a little bit early. Uh, but we'll have a free for all once we've got to um, questions that uh, any other points that people want to raise with anybody so we can clear those up. Yes. Can I, can I make a couple of following Please. points, if I may? One is uh, on, on, on the point of lowering the FI returns. Okay. So as, as supportive of as I am okay, and of expanding the FI's roles, I always get a bit scared when people talk about lowering returns. I, mean, I, I think that there needs to be consistently a very clear distinction between money and financing that is there to generate returns and the discipline with the discipline associated with that. And then in a separate pocket altogether, grants, <coughs> grant money that yeah. you know is there to be spent and not recovered. Okay. And, 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 and I think it's, it's, it's very important to explore what kind of partnerships you know, in specific cases you know, there, there should be between, between the two and what, and what are the situations in which this development, yet commercial money, okay, needs to be supported by uh, 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 lead loss uh, grants type, but I'd, I'd be, I, 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 I get wary of discussions where... You muddle the two. Exactly. Yeah, I got it. That's very good. So that's one. The, the, the other one uh, uh, is, is a response to a comment Minouche made earlier, you know, on, uh, you know, why not simply lend more to the states that are doing less risky stuff? And, and, one of the recommendations I made, again, in my view, was that too much of many DFI's balance sheet is public-to-public -public funding, okay? and and not enough. And when you look at an agent, an important agency such as the Africa Development Bank, a lot of what they do is state-to-state -state lending or lending <coughs> state-led projects. And and it's true that you could argue that at some level, you know, it's. Uh, it's less risky money in that respect. You know, you have the implicit sovereign guarantee built in, built in there. Uh, but, but the challenge with that is, is twofold. Number one is I'd argue that many of these projects, many of these infrastructure projects that are state-led could actually be privately led, whether you're talking about roads or uh, power plants. From my perspective, there is no reason why this couldn't be structured as public-private partnerships with... The, you know the capital coming primarily from the the private sector, and I would argue that in terms of reducing fragility over the long term, and and building resilience, mm -hmm. that that's a much more effective way of doing it than simply expanding state balance sheets and, and state state budgets. So that's number one. And number two, is is when 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 those public pri public private initiatives don't happen, and 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 instead a lot of that. Uh, uh, DFI or export credit money goes to state entities to do projects. I'd argue that you actually get the reverse effect, where over time you have a crowd crowding out of, of the private sector, uh, uh, and this and and the state, because it has the financing available, ending up doing projects that go beyond even the basic infrastructure that you'd argue that we can have a debate about. And you found this, you know, you found and and under the argument that there isn't. A developed enough private sector go do a lot of other things themselves that make that may, then make it more difficult for any private sector to develop. Um, Wang, I'm going to come to you. Um, two, two, two questions really. The first is is um, probably rather obvious, but I'm not sure I totally got it. I think you made a very interesting point about how institutions like EGAD and ECOVAS and the other sub regional. Air groupings in Africa were helping to make um, these investments more possible. I just want you to explain how and why, and if that's the case, how do we build on that? Do these organizations need to become stronger? Do they need to behave differently? I wanted to understand how, how that worked. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, the reason why we find those regional organizations very useful is because they have gravitas uh, in the states. Uh, systems that uh, operate in the fragile states. Uh, there are links that they are looked, up to by they are looked by upon the and they seem to have uh, sort of uh, pool capacity uh, to assert themselves than the private sector. So we use them as intermediaries. We use them to broker relationships and uh, to try and sometimes uh, push uh, the government to accept uh, and are there any you know if you had to rank them in order of like to work with SADC or which who where do they 
Who's your favorite? I, I think <laughs> <laughs> I think different uh, regions uh, somehow these uh, um, associations have different impact in different regions. Yeah. So I think the answer to that would depend on where you are operating in. We find, for instance, operations in South Sudan. IGAD seems to have some uh, crop in getting the government of South Sudan to respond to issues that are raised, maybe because of the way the structures has been built. But again, in terms of policy, your advice to us would be work with these organizations, seek to find ways to strengthen and help them because they can help the deliver development. I don't want to put words in your mouth, but that's... I, I that's, would say involve. Yeah, okay. Maybe a, a lighter word might be to involve. But Mr. Chairman, allow me to just uh, make a contribution to the debate of uh, getting development institution principally focus on uh, public uh, projects. And one of uh, the biggest challenges is that uh, public projects, whether it's roads, whether it's power, they are not an aid in themselves. The ultimate uh, um, objective uh, that we should be able is to build uh, capacity in the people, is to mobilize people into a economic activities that then becomes the base. And essentially, a uh, partnership of uh, the development institutions with the private sectors then become a catalytic role uh, in mobilizing lo domestic and local resources, mobilizing uh, uh, the people. And essentially, there is always a challenge uh, in fragile states of capital. And essentially, if you look at equity, we have about uh, $600 million from uh, uh, DFIs. Uh, and that's the only money because domestically, there is no savings in the first place. So essentially for you to lead and build uh, the private sector in such situations, you need those uh, partnerships. And lastly, it is not always true that uh, uh, governments in fragile states have the capacity mm -hmm. and there are appropriate governance structures uh, to prudently utilize the resources uh, that are envisaged. Uh, so a, a balance might be appropriate to be struck. Uh, on, on, on. Thank you. I, this is my second question. I just want to understand a bit more your point about exemptions on the regulations. I mean, obviously, we can't exempt investors from, you know, uh, not having to obey money laundering rules or what have you. But I was trying to understand a bit more what exactly you were suggesting. So I, I think what we, uh, Mr. Chairman was suggesting is let's take a country like uh, Somalia. Yeah. You find there is no institutional framework yeah. to deal with those issues. So it's essentially it's an open uh, uh, field. So there are no mechanisms within the country of filtering, of regulating, or uh, managing uh, those uh, risks. So essentially private sector who comes to be part of the transformation of the country uh, find it very punitive uh, that they are penalized for their own initiatives. Uh, because they're trying to come and help. So that's... Uh, but what's the answer to that? What, what, without exempting people altogether from dealing with people they shouldn't, they suddenly find out they turn out they're on a sanctions watch list or what have you. What, what's the... I'm trying to... What's the take out from this? What's the... My, my take is uh, on mechanisms uh, of dealing with those issues. I'm not saying... That, I'm not suggesting the issues don't be dealt with. I'm not suggesting... Uh, it's the application of the, those laws. Yeah. Applying a law in... A, uh, uh, um, a sta a different states should be have different thresholds. That, that's right. Some um, questions before we come to Diana. Any last questions for James or others? Please. You mentioned uh, a lot of social things you did associated with your investments. You mentioned financial literacy and education programs. How do you make the finances work? How do you how do you pay for those in fragile states? Uh, thank you very much. We see uh, capacity building in society as a form of investment. We take a long-term view. And the only way um, that uh, when you have a long-term view, you could rapidly grow is to be a catalyst in uh, building the capacity in the people, either to borrow. The second aspect of it, you get reward by reduced risk. When uh, you really enhance the capacity of a borrower, uh, the default risk uh, significantly comes down. But it is best scaled uh, when you create a public-private part, uh, partnership. So you have uh, 
uh, global, like uh, we work very closely with the MasterCard Foundation. They come on, on board and say, you seem to be doing a good job. Can we scale this? Well, the others are bilateral organization like DFID here and says, we'd like, we'd like to associate with what you are doing. Uh, can we be your partner? So, yeah. Diana, um, my first question to you, and then I'll open up to everyone, questions to you or questions to anyone before we uh, close this evidence session. Um, thank you for your evidence. I thought, I wonder whether there was a slight conflict between, on the one hand, saying we might need to look at the return thresholds for these institutions, but on the other hand, governments might not be the right owners. I mean, if we're going to lower return thresholds and accept more of the public policy need for the Paul's reason that the real risk is the risk of state failure, isn't it all the more important to keep something in an accountability structure where at least there's a way of explaining to the ultimate shareholders, the public, well of course this institution is making much money as it should because there are wider public policy goals. How do you, how would you find a way through that? So of course accountability is at the heart of any investment organisation. Um, but I feel that this kind of activity uh, needs accountability with an owner and a governance structure that has been devised around it to create um, the realistic expectations of what might emerge from these activities and the time frames that are necessary to achieve those. And uh, so sort of the model that I kind of have in my head and I did put in the uh, evidence was ACFED. So ACFED has the Aga Khan yeah. Foundation. So <coughs> ACFED is the economic development part of the whole Aga Khan network. So it's the bit that does do business building. Uh, it is not short of accountability. Um, the, the team are very much reporting to His Highness about uh, about what they do against very clear uh, metrics they have very high standards there but the great thing they have is um, realism about the time frames uh, realism about the likelihood of failure uh, and that creates a protective barrier if I can put it like that for the team that's doing this hard work because if you have that protective barrier, then you have the confidence to go out and actually do the hardest work that actually that exists. And that's why I feel that thinking about the architecture um, of whatever is put in place to do this, uh, I think is fundamental to its ultimate success. Jim, just coming in on, on this, because I thought it was an extremely intriguing comment that you made. Mm -hmm. yeah. But, but you still a little bit, I think, um, backed off being able to come up with an architecture. I mean, is it realistic to think that one could populate the world on a scale that we would need to bring private capital to, well, the developing world more generally, but fragile states in particular, using the model of the Aga Khan Foundation, which, laudable though it might be, bringing in sufficient amounts of capital to leverage that model looks quite so, unlikely, but, but you, you see a world where we could just be, would we set up many such organizations? Would we put our eggs in a particular yeah, So let's look at, let's look at what is actually needed. What is needed is some people in each of the uh, fragile countries, a team that's going, that is incredibly well networked and seen as insiders, who are going to stay there for a long time, so probably locals, uh, supported by probably a central team of industry experts, and we kind of all know the industries that are most likely to get started in, in federal states, so you get the sort of the best of it. This is not a large number of people, and the capital that you need to start businesses actually could be really small, and in, in lots of ways, the more you starve, startups of capital, the higher quality they quite often tend to be. So you, this is not an activity that requires a great deal of capital, but the balance between cost of team and size of balance sheet is different to other investing organisations, so that's part of the sort of expectation setting that you would need to have. The capital that is needed is for scale up once you've got through the first phase there is no shortage of that capital. That's what the DFIs are desperate for, are things that have been architected in a high quality way, 
either with local, fantastic local entrepreneurs like James, or designed by this institution, and that's incredibly hard, so as we all know. In country institutions, so you'd have lots of them. You'd have so in in um, Rwanda, you'd have a Rwanda Development Foundation that would be. No. Yeah, so I haven't given a great deal of thought to, to this yet, but so let's, let's kind of go with this. You'd, maybe you'd have an umbrella organisation with a, you know, Archipon obviously has his highness, but s someone who is a figurehead, very well respected, <laughs> very well respected, but prepared to stick with this for 20 years. Okay, that's the important bit. Uh, and then that organization decides in which countries you're going to put teams and then you have obviously a learning between the countries uh, but as a, and then going out and attracting the capital to support this I think one of the really exciting things that's happening at the moment is the desire of impact capital to take much much lower returns and even losses in order to achieve impact as I say it's not a lot of capital I think the capital raising bit of this is the easy bit the hard bit is the architecture and the people. And architecture that also works for the country itself. Precisely. There's a danger of these institutions being seen as other Really that key, so really key. Right, free for all. Um, any questions to any of our witnesses on anything? <laughs> just to be provocative, isn't Oreos exactly the model you just described? Mm -hmm. There's uh, something... It, so Oreos. you know it is part of a barrage now. Yeah. So, 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 uh, yeah, so, so Oris was um, uh, set up within CDC and then Norfund. Uh, it was a network of SME investors across lots of different countries. I wouldn't say the local very offices. local offices, quite a high uh, cost infrastructure uh, and supported by the DFIs for a, a long period and created an immense amount of impact but not necessarily in the very hardest places. So I think Aureus is largely the model, but pushed even further. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so I guess a question for Neil. Um, I'm still struggling to see the um, question of how you manage this reputational risk. When you see a set of projects in Somalia, say, there's presumably a bunch of other projects that could have existed there. But a lot of people are thinking, well, you know, at some point in those, setting up those projects, I'm going to be able to sort of servant, a politician, a businessman who is going you know, to subsequently end up on some international register of doing bad things. And so people just say, well, <laughs> you know, I don't want that to happen. So is there kind of a, you know, we're talking about architecture, is there some sort of architecture that could be set up so that you know, you are protected from that, so you're more willing, you recognize that's likely to happen, but you're, more, you're, you're sort of more willing to invest. Because I sense that's a really, okay. really, really, really big constraint. Or whether you go to private, more, more private front planets, I don't know, but it does strike me as, if you're in Somalia, <laughs> you know, you're, you're definitely almost with 100% going to end up with some problematic. Neil. So I think I'd like to link that to what, what James said earlier. I think in many cases it's local banks and local financial institutions who are actually there in the environment on the ground who are best placed to make these judgments. I think both for us as DFIs investing in those banks and for international regulators looking at the operations of those banks, whether it's in terms of basal risk frameworks or AML, CFT frameworks, I think that would be the where I would look to see can we provide this little bit of a sort of flexibility or leeway that James talks about to accept that in that environment those banks are going to deal with perhaps a, a broader spectrum of clients, shall we say, than we'd accept in other countries. I think DFIs, we have a big franchise obviously financing the, the, those banks and you know, one issue you know, that we're currently struggling with is that these banks are losing their correspondent banking relationships with uh, developed country banks because those banks don't want to take the regulatory risk either. And that is a huge impediment to restoring trade to these fragile and conflict states. So I think that would be a key part of the solution. Yeah. 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 Ye
David, I have a question. Yeah, please. Yeah. I have a question actually to uh, Paddy, James, or Hisham, because you are the private investors, I think, amongst everybody. What would get you to encourage other investors? I think one of the biggest questions we have is how to get more investors investing in fragile and uh, conflict mm. zones. And the three of you obviously did it. You, you said, uh, Paddy, at the beginning that you decided to go and visit a lot of African countries and then decided on Sierra Leone to start your, your business there. Um, same goes to Hisham and James. I'm, sh I'm sure you did your own due diligence. But what would what would you say to other investors, and how would you encourage them to actually invest? <coughs> private investors. I mean, away from the FIs, away from just private investors to invest in these countries. Very good question, Hisham. Why don't you go first? Pleasure. I, I think I think um, I, I think you start with um, with with developing the local private sector i.e you know when so egypt is our home base but when we when we expanded outside of egypt uh, we we went into places either after significant diligence and significant and having invested a lot of time getting getting comfortable with with the geography or in other cases uh, and i think that's the easier example in partnership backing a local entrepreneur ourselves, okay, or partnering with a local entrepreneur. I think I think making the case to a, a you know a London-based or European-based company to go and just jump in and, and and go into a fragile state on their own is much harder than making the case for a partnership that gradually evolves with 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 a local player. Hence, again, I think uh, uh, circling back to the importance of, of finding mechanisms, DFIs and others, of promoting the local private sector and developing an ecosystem of local entrepreneurs that become local industrialists and that evolve into the type of the type of people and entities that larger uh, 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 private international investors or larger companies then feel comfortable enough going going and partnering with. Jay. I think I would uh, really agree that uh, you have to have a base initially that you consider a little bit safer and secure in terms of risk uh, that becomes the spring springboard. But for us to go to South Sudan, to go to uh, DLC, our consideration about Ethiopia is more of following trade lines. Uh, the trade links have already been established, so you are pursuing and uh, you are trying uh, to uh, lead a create business on themes that already exist across the border with people. But there are countries that uh, our consideration, for instance, of going to DLC was embedded strongly on IFC agreeing to be our partner. So you really look for a partner who could help you mitigate uh, the risk yes. of that uh, country. So partnerships are very uh, essential. And then uh, the last one is that this, you must have a very long-term view. Uh, in some of these things you don't make uh, easy money. So an investor who have not established a base that can support a long-term view might find it increasingly uh, to start a business in fragile states. Okay. Anything to add, Paddy? Let's come back to you. Yes, I'd say the, the key thing is to make your own assessment of risk. You know, don't rely on reading analyst reports at your desk in London or you know, news coverage and so on. You know, go and have a proper look for yourself because you may find that the the reality on the ground is very different from the, the popular perception, as of course we found in Sierra Leone, uh, and is the foundation of our business model, you know, to capture that misplaced risk. So don't work on assumptions, you know, form your own view of risk. But just a question for, I think, for James and some of you actually. So listen to what you're saying. So most fragile states tend to have one big successful state very close by that has better cultural sensitivity, understanding of markets <coughs> close by. Would an idea be to actually find companies, businesses in the more stable state close by region. and work with them or the region to actually be the way to actually go to these fragile states? Good. So why are you trying to go there directly? Good question. I, I think ideally, if you have a strong state neighbor like uh, Kenya and uh, uh, Somalia or South Sudan, you see that uh, the trade needs between the people themselves yeah. are established across the, uh, the border. Yeah. So business is coming to institutionalize or to formalize existing and to provide logistics to support that already existing 
So equity will be best position with our 12 million customers in Kenya. You'll find the bulk of the customers and of Kenyan customer uh, entrepreneurs trading in South Sudan will be our customers. So it becomes very easy to enable them because you can support them with the credit in South Sudan without necessarily asking for credit because you have a credit history from Kenya which can provide the guarantee. Very good point. I think we've been at it for two hours. I think that's a good moment actually to thank our witnesses. I think it's been a really good session. I think we had a very good exchange of, um, first of all, thank you for the notes you sent and they were excellent. Very good answers to the questions. And I think quite a good interchange with some real thinking emerging on how we tackle particularly this problem of uh, small scale, higher risk venture capital trying to build um, the enterprises in these countries, which is what today's session is all about. So I think it's been, been really good. Thank you very much indeed. Meeting Thank closed. Thank you. Thank you.